Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's really good to see you after two years. We've missed you. Um, so thank you. Thank you for coming to the seventh annual James M. and Margaret H. Coaston Lecture in Early Christianity. I'm Julia Lamb. I'm a professor of theology here at Georgetown. If there's a silver lining to all of this, it is that we are for the first time live streaming this event. And so we have people joining us from across the country, from over the world, and uh, probably also from pockets in the metro area of people who didn't want to brave the, the Georgetown rush hour. So welcome also to, the, to our virtual guests. Thank you for attending. Thank you for being here. If we could, I'd like to take just a few moments of silence to remember those whom we've lost in these past 20 months. Thank you. This lectureship was established with three main objectives in mind, to honor leading scholars and celebrate their contributions to the field, to hold an annual public lecture on early Christianity that would bring together the academy, the general public, and various religious communities, and finally to support both the study and the teaching of early Christian literature, history, and practice. On behalf of the University, Georgetown College, and the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, I'd like to thank Jay and Margaret Coston for this generous gift and for their ongoing support. Thank you so much. I'd also like to, th like to thank our co-sponsor this year, the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Thank you to Tom Banchoff, Michael Kessler, Amy Vandervliet, Jamang Tong, and most especially Ruth Gopin for her expertise and untiring collaboration. Now to introduce our speaker. Columbus Stewart is a native of Houston, Texas. He received his bachelor's degree in history and literature from Harvard and did his graduate work at Yale, St. John's University, and the University of Oxford. He is a specialist in early Christian monasticism and is himself a Benedictine monk at the beautiful St. John's Abbey in Minnesota. His scholarship has earned him numerous coveted awards and fellowships, almost too long to name. Just two years ago, he received perhaps the greatest honor, at least for an American scholar in the humanities. He delivered the Jefferson Lecture at the National Endowment for the humanities. His scholarship is meticulous. He is steeped in the primary texts as he engages the history of interpretation. He challenges preconceptions as he invites us, his readers, to allow our minds, quote, to travel more widely and to dwell with the self. He is very much a scholar's scholar. I will leave it to his brothers to say whether he is a monk's monk but I might venture to suggest that he is a monk's scholar in that his scholarship begins and ends in listening. In his Jefferson lecture, which I encourage you to watch uh, online, it's really quite marvelous, he spoke of the humanistic principle, quote, that to understand people of different cultures with different beliefs, we must listen to their own voices, unquote. This brings me to Professor Stewart's other job as Executive Director of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, or Himmel, at St. John's. In the 1960s, the Benedictines began a project of photographing old manuscripts in Europe in order to preserve them for posterity in the event of another catastrophic world war. That enterprise has since expanded to include manuscripts from many different traditions, and has expanded geographically to Africa, the Middle East, and now, as I understand it, into Central Asia. Himmel works with local partners, training them and supporting them as they digitize 
their ancient manuscripts and thus work to preserve their cultural heritage. All of this labor is rooted in an ancient Benedictine motivation. As he put it in his Jefferson lecture, quote, copying for the sake of learning, learning for the sake of understanding, understanding for the sake of worship and thanksgiving, unquote. The lecture we will hear this evening is, as you can see, Ascetic Influencers, the Manichaeans, and the Development of Early Christian Asceticism. It's part of his next major publication, a monograph entitled Between Earth and Heaven, The Origins of Christian Asceticism and Monasticism. Please join me in welcoming Columbus Stewart, OSB. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. And thank you, Julia, for the gracious introduction. I was recently introduced um, with the phrase, a Benedictine monk like no other, which I think my brothers would certainly agree with. <laughs> and I'd like to echo the thanks for J. Margaret Coaston for their sponsorship of this lecture. And your kind hospitality, including Jay's reaching into the further uh, esoteric of mixology and learning how a Benedictine monk likes his martini, so <laughs> I'm very grateful for that. So my, my task this evening is to introduce into the understanding of the development of early Christian asceticism, by which I mean before the movement we know as monasticism, that kind of official institutionalized form of Christian asceticism, the role of particularly the Manichaeans, but also other voices and traditions that may be unfamiliar to many of you simply in the hope of uh, helping us to understand the broader array of formative influences on early Christian asceticism and therefore on the Christian monastic tradition of which I am a member. So to, to get us oriented, I wanna uh, begin by reminding us of what the traditional, as it were, canonical model of the uh, monastic genealogy or lineage is, which has this sort of Egyptian component up here on the left of the desert tradition of Antony the Great and the desert fathers and mothers. Then you have the Cenobitic communal monastic tradition of Pacomius and Basil the Great, and it sort of flows down in its Latin version with a bit of Augustine to Benedict in its Eastern version to St. Sabas and then Mount Athos in the great monastic tradition of Russia. And there you can see in this traditional model, I can insert myself as if it were a family tree, so Benedict me. Right. And of course, this is, a, this is a literary genealogy. This is the canonical literature which has uh, guided Christian monasticism for many, many centuries. But this is not an historical picture of how the thing actually grew. For that, we have to bring in many other voices. Some of them, uh, that would be considered orthodox by the standards of the post fourth century and others which certainly would not be, but were either directly a part of this development of Christian asceticism, or were significant players on the fringes and therefore had an influence. And you can see that this is a much more interesting way of looking at the world, not least because it brings in women, for example. It brings in urban ascetics. It brings in those more clearly influenced and guided by Greek philosophy. Etc. So what I propose to do this evening is to explore one little corner of this broader view, one, one neighborhood, you might say, and that's this one up in the upper right-hand corner. So I want to, in a sense, work backwards from Basil the Great, Eustathian communities, the Benai and Benath Kiyama of the Syriac Christian tradition, and then uh, the Manichaeans, which will be where I'll end up eventually in this overview this evening. Uh, 
to try to, to understand how there might have been mutual influences, even if not the strict literary genealogy of the classical model that we were just looking at. And I want to accompany this kind of schematic view with a map, because uh, I'm a great believer in maps, because so many modern people are not. So as a result, it helps to orient ourselves geographically. And this is a depiction of uh, the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire as it existed in the latter part of the fourth century. And you have circled in blue these uh, major centers, Episcopal sees and so on, which are associated with uh, Greek texts, so Greek ascetical literature, theological literature. So Caesarea of Basil and Sebastia we'll hear about in just a moment, of course the great city of Antioch, and then Baroya there, which is modern Aleppo. And then as you move to the east, you move into more purely Syriac territory. Now Syriac is spoken all over the place here, but in terms of the literature produced from some of these regions, as you get to places like Edessa and Amida and Nisibis, and then over to Nineveh and Arbella, this is the heartland of Syriac literature. And so this is that Mesopotamian realm that is so important for what I'm gonna be speaking about this evening. And just one last comment about geography. We see maps like this and we see the former place names and we don't always connect the places of the past to the present living communities and situation of these locations. And just a reminder, uh, did I go the wrong way? Yeah, here we go. So there's Aleppo, uh, Amida Diyarbakir, which is the flashpoint for the Turkish Kurdish uh, troubles of recent years. Nineveh of the prophet Jonah is uh, Mosul. And then the ancient town of Arbella with all of its many archeological layers is Erbil, the capital of the Kurdish autonomous region of northern Iraq. And again, a very contested bit of geography. So this is just to say that I don't think we should confine our study of history purely to the past, but we always need to keep in mind the communities that hang on there. Uh, many of them continuing some of the traditions that I'll speak about this evening. And many of those communities, of course, um, are in really uh, grave distress at the moment for a variety of reasons, which we could talk about perhaps in the discussion. So let's march on. Um, actually, I'm gonna go back to that map before I, I start showing you a manuscript or two. And we're gonna begin by talking a little bit about the trajectory of Christian asceticism from a kind of domestic framework to a communal framework, and where that began to emerge in the surviving uh, literature. Remembering always that what we have is a fraction of what there was in terms of literature. And so we are trying to assemble pictures of complex historical developments, having only a few of the pieces of the mosaic or, or the puzzle which means that anything that we claim about early Christianity is provisional at best, uh, only to be completely modified or overturned by the next discovery of a textual or archeological resource, which adds to the picture. But having said that, we, we do have certain times and places, what, what I've sometimes called observable moments, where we have a, a critical mass of literature, ideally from more than one voice, which allows us to get at least a taste of what the particular culture was, uh, the intellectual culture, the ascetical culture, uh, you name it. And one of the places where we have that is, so back to the original map, is Asia Minor, and particularly that sort of northeastern part of Asia Minor, so associated in the canonical tradition with Basil the Great, but as I wanna argue, really dependent for the ascetic inspiration upon Basil on another tradition, which is one of those eclipsed on the family tree uh, for the kind of political and doctrinal region, reasons which become so prominent in the later fourth century. So, very quick thumbnail sketch. Claim one, Christian asceticism was there from the beginning because Christians got it from the Jews from sectarian ascetic Judaism at the time of Jesus, and also from philosophical traditions which had strict discipline for the pursuit of insight and knowledge. So that's, that's the first thing to realize. It's not an exclusively Christian invention. 
And it also, I think, is baked into Christianity from the beginning in one way or another. Secondly, asceticism uh, was originally, and indeed to this day, often an anonymous enterprise. So it is not necessarily lived in established, recognizable institutional forms. There have always been holy men and women who, um, who lead a life of a particular asceticism, whatever that may be, whether that's one of poverty, or whether that's one of celibacy or dispossession. But there have also been, um, from the re very early days, people recognized for their particular devotion to prayer and fasting. Holy widows, uh, more and more evidence in the early decades of the church for people who chose to remain virgins rather than marrying for life. Men as well as women. This, this wasn't simply a, a female phenomenon, although often we think that the, the literature of virginity in early Christianity is only at, for and about women. That's actually not true. But the way in which it was typically lived early on was in a family home. Now, that tells you right away that if a family could afford to have a child who doesn't marry and lives in the home as an ascetic, uh, they at least have some means because they don't need to enter the marriage market for the sake of economic or social advantage, whether it be the son or the daughter, and they can afford to, to feed a person who will not be engaged in normal sort of worldly secular activities. And we begin to see treatises written about and for this domestic asceticism both encouraging the people who undertake it as well as admonitions and guidance for the parents who weren't really sure about this thing that their children wanted to do. And that, of course, is a phenomenon that continues to the present day, although perhaps not about the practice of asceticism. Now, one of the most famous examples of domestic asceticism that we have is that associated with the family of Basil the Great. And many of you know the story because it's really been recovered in recent years. Uh, particularly as people have become more interested in the role of women in the development of early Christian asceticism, uh, particularly in the powerhouse, which was Basil's sister, Macrina, who at a critical point in the family history when the father had died and the mother was sort of at loose ends, not knowing what to do, said, we are going to become an ascetic household. And then they sort of relocated the family to their country retreat it's always convenient to have a ranch, as we say in Texas, so they, they repaired to the ranch. And it is there that they gradually converted their family home from being not only uh, members of the family le leading some kind of dedicated ascetic life, but also telling the servants one morning that uh, they're now going to be ascetics too, which, which probably was a minimal disruption in their way of life, uh, unfortunately. But for whatever reason, well, they had to, I suppose, go along with it. And then various others started, started to join and so on. And people have sometimes thought this is kind of a big bang moment in the development of asceticism. But of course, the effort of, of Macrina and the other members of the family did not come out of nowhere. In fact, they were putting into practice in their particular family location a form of asceticism that had been uh, developed by a family friend. And this is the controversial Eustathius, who lived from around 300 to 377, who was an ascetic leader and later bishop in Sebastia, the principal city of Asia, uh, Armenia Minor. And there you see Sebastia circled on the screen. He frequently had to travel from his diocese to Constantinople for business in the capital. And uh, because this was an affluent, pious family with an impeccable Christian lineage, this was the sort of place that an enterprising bishop would make a point of stopping at, because these clearly are people who could be patrons in the life and growth of the church. And it just so happened that the family estate was right at one of the turning points of the road um, heading up to Constantinople. And there are hints in Basil's letters that Eustathius was a regular visitor to the family home from the 340s on. So very formative in terms of the childhood of the members of the family. Now, he was a very complicated figure, Eustathius. Uh, and it may be one of those cases that it wasn't his own fault, but he's one of those people who somehow always got in trouble for one thing or another, even if he didn't intend to. And uh, one example would be 
the fact that he grows up in Sebastia, his father's the bishop. Eustathius goes to Alexandria. Uh, a lot of people did because it had fantastic philosophical schools and theological schools. Um, and it was sort of part of the grand tour of people who wanted to become intellectual or ecclesiastical powerhouses in the early church. And in Alexandria, he must have encountered various forms of ascetic life, Christian and other. When he returned home and was ordained a priest, he decided to present himself as a Christian philosopher, wearing the philosopher's distinctive cloak rather than the dress expected of a priest. As you may guess, this eccentricity did not go down well, and according to the historian Socrates, his own father excommunicated him. So he goes off to Constantinople to try to pull it together and start over, and in the meantime is condemned by a council held at the town of Gangra in the province of Paphlagonia. The surviving decrees are a mine of information about tension between ascetics and ecclesiastical authority in the first part of the fourth century. Whatever other business they had to do, the bishops gathered there took time to not only draft canons, condemning various uh, dubious ascetic practices, but also to write a letter to the bishops of Armenia accompanying the canons. In other words, writing a letter to the province where Eustathius had been active. It seems that Eustathius, as a Christian philosopher, wanted to develop an ascetic community and began to do so, but in ways which created ecclesiastical anxiety, which is a recurrent theme in the history of asceticism and monasticism, by the way. Their concerns were mostly about good order. Not, uh, they didn't want these ascetics to dress eccentrically, like the philosopher's cloak, or in ways that did not conform to social norms. So for example, women should not dress in the clothing of men, such as the philosopher's cloak. They wanted to respect family structures and obligations, so don't encourage children to leave their parents or spouses to, to separate from each other to become ascetics. They should pray in churches rather than their own assemblies. Perhaps most pointedly, they should not divert donations which might otherwise have gone to the bishop, to their own coffers, uh, always an issue. And they should fast on the days canonically approved for fasting rather than according to their own customs. Now, in these uh, canons, there are echoes of earlier controversies which were long a part of these tensions between ascetics and authority. But what makes this particular controversy so interesting is that it was resolved in the heart of the church. Eustathius would eventually succeed his father as bishop, having successfully mainstreamed his ascetics. And the historian Sozomen, writing in the mid-5th century, so that Eustathius righted things by adopting normal clerical and Episcopal garb and using his own gift of teaching to preach a proper Christian understanding of sexuality, which affirmed marriage while condemning deviant forms of ascetic sexuality, such as the cohabitation of male and female ascetics, which was a particularly neuralgic point for bishops uh, through the fourth century. Now Eustathius' model proved to be very decisive in the family of Basil. One could argue the, the monastery that emerged out of the family home was a Eustathian community, though it was not in the city. But of course, you uh, probably know that Basil himself quickly attached himself to a bishop and became a kind of advisor to established ascetic communities which were clearly Eustathian-inspired ascetic groups. And so Basil's famous asceticon, sometimes called his rule or rules in the plural, they are questions and answers, is really a series of guidelines for these established communities, which he himself did not found, but which it became his task to guide uh, modeling it on the success of Eustathius in keeping these ascetics within the church and working out a modus vivendi, which did not upset the, uh, the sort of social norms and structures that were thought to be important for the effective functioning of the church. Now, why don't we know more about this? Well, the reason we don't know more about this is that eventually Basil and Eustathius had a falling out, and this was over aspects of the doctrine of the Council of Nicaea in its 
the later stages of the controversy leading up to the Council of Constantinople, which more than 50 years after Nicaea, finally settled the question officially, at least for the imperial church. And so Eustathius was branded with the term heretic for being soft on a kind of neo-Nicene line, theologically, and Basil, in a sense, replaced him as the key figure in the history of asceticism. Now, we have descriptions of how these communities live, but you, you can sort of imagine. They're living in towns and villages. They're wearing simple garb. They're praying together. They're fasting. They're doing works of mercy and service. And again, they're doing it at the heart of the church. Now, given the fact that these Eustathian communities played a key role in resolving tensions between ascetics and ecclesiastical leaders about sectarian elitism, one can't help but wonder where Eustathius got the idea. Was he the one who invented this kind of asceticism, lived at the heart of the church, um, or was he inspired by another ascetic tradition? Now, I mentioned that he went to Alexandria to study, and he would have met um, you know, various kinds of ascetics there. But just like Basil, who made the same journey, there is nothing in Eustathian asceticism or in Basil's ascetical writings which suggests any kind of obvious Egyptian influence. So from that, that kind of nascent Egyptian monasticism associated with Antony and others. So what I want to suggest is that given the lack of obvious other influence, we need to look in another direction, to the east, for possible parallels. And I want to suggest that Eustathian communities more closely resemble and arguably inspired by the ascetic forms of Syriac Christianity. In Mesopotamia, in the, from the late 40s um, CE, multiple texts mention and describe what were called sons and daughters of the covenant. These were never married ascetics, the sons and daughters of the covenant, and there were also alongside them Kadishe, who were uh, previously married people who then became ascetics. So they might have been uh, widows or widowers, or they may be a married couple that raised the kids and did well and looked across the breakfast table one morning and said, let's do something different. So we're going to be ascetics now. And this was, this was actually quite common in early Christianity. And, you know, I think there's a certain obvious appeal. Um, so in any case, these communities, from what we can tell, were geographically widespread across Syriac language Mesopotamia and fully integrated into the life of the larger church. And from what we can see, this form of asceticism lasted well into the fifth century when the monastic paradigm, uh, not solely inspired by Egypt, but totally informed and shaped by Egyptian monastic literature, swept all before it. But we do have some of these observable moments in the fourth and fifth centuries when we can see the covenant in its fullest vigor. Writing from the first half of the fourth century by Afrahat, active in the 330s and 340s, and by Ephraim, who uh, died in 373, extol and instruct members of the covenant and cognate ascetics. While texts from the early fifth century, especially Rabula of Edessa, an interesting character in his own right, uh, show them existing alongside another form of asceticism defined by its isolation from towns and cities, uh, the towns and cities where the members of the covenant lived. So a kind of uh, first appearance in that literature of what we think of as classical monasticism. Another fourth century text, the Book of Steps, depicts uh, a Christian community with two forms of discipleship. The ascetic perfect Christians, who renounced marriage and possessions, living as if their minds were in heaven, even if their feet were on the earth. And then, on the other hand, the just or righteous Christians, the householders, who provided material support for the perfect ones. The author mentions the covenant, the sons and daughters of the covenant, incidentally and respectfully, though he seems to be writing for another kind of ascetic community that observed that kind of distinction, in his case, the perfect and the just. 
But of course, these were not the only ascetics in the region, and this is where we can start to turn toward um, my main topic. The Martianite church, for example, with its core of celibate members, was a major force in this region. And this goes right back to the second century. And uh, the teachings of Marcion, whom everybody learns in history of theology, is the guy who wanted to throw out a lot of the New Testament because he was very afraid that it was tainted by Jewish influence. And also, he was a dualist and didn't like anything that suggested uh, a goodness of a creator or material creation. And so we think he had his moment and then just sort of vanished in a puff of smoke, like any of the diabolical forces that we are taught about in those traditional surveys of heresy and orthodoxy. But in fact, his followers continued. And what was originally a school of interpretation became actually a church, uh, to the point that the oldest uh, datable church in Syria from an inscription on the cornerstone was a Martianite church from the fourth century. And then, of course, there were the Manichaeans, whose founder, Mani, whose dates are around 216 to 274, was born in southern Mesopotamia and wrote in Syriac. His movement, inspired in part by Christianity, but based also on his own mythic cosmology and radical dualism, was composed of the elect, celibate ascetics, famed for their fasting and their strict diet, and the married hearers who supported the elect financially in exchange for spiritual benefits. And the Martianites had the same thing. The core of their movement were celibates. Again, they may have been people who never married or people who became ascetics after marriage, and they were supported in turn by the larger part of the church, and it was the job of the ascetics to fast and pray more for the sake of the rest of the movement. Could Syriac Christianity's model of the covenant or the book of the steps with the perfect and the just be explained by contact and competition with Martianites and Manichaeans? So before we turn to that, just to underscore the significance of the Kiyama, the covenant, and so that I can uh, hold my head high and say I did actually refer to manuscripts, since that is my day job, is, is working with manuscripts. Uh, I just want to suggest something very interesting from a very famous Syriac manuscript that helps us to understand the centrality of the covenant for Syriac Christianity. And that's from accounts in Syriac literature of those martyred within the Roman Empire before 313, and most especially those who suffered during the lesser known but even more savage suppression in the Persian Empire under Shapur II and his successors. And this began right around the time that the persecution in the Western Empire ended. Sons and daughters of the covenant, as well as the consecrated ones, those Kadishe, the previously married ascetics, are regularly mentioned in the lists and acts of the martyrs, identified by rank, just like the clergy. So, for example, here we have this one. In the final leaves of the oldest known dated Syriac manuscript, written in Edessa in 411, now, bracket, for those of you who don't work with manuscripts, or Christian manuscripts, this is really, really old. All right, so just so you understand, we don't have a lot of stuff from fourth century. And many of our oldest Christian manuscripts are in fact Syriac ones. So in the final leaves of this manuscript, there is a list of martyrs from both the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. The Western list was translated from a Greek source of the mid fourth century, perhaps compiled at least in part by the great ecclesiastical historian Eusebius. In that Western list, only the names of clerics have an indication of rank or office. There is no mention of ascetics. But the Syriac appendix lists the clergy, so bishops, priests, deacons, subdeacons. Then it lists by name the various sons of the covenant, daughters of the, oh, sons of the covenant, the faithful ones, consecrated ones, male, then the daughters of the covenant, and the women. And so in this list, you sort of zero in. And this, by the way, is a page of the manuscript that was left behind in Egypt when the British went shopping in the 19th century and took all these fantastic Syriac manuscripts to London. And this was identified by um, the great Sebastian Brock, my Syriac teacher, and Lucas von Rompuy, and reunited with the rest of the manuscript in the British Library. 
And we know from the rest of the manuscript in the British Library when it was written, and this fragment supplies us the list of people with their identification by rank. And we find this throughout accounts of the martyrs in the hagiography of the period. You find them identified by their ascetic rank, just like bishops, priests, and deacons. Now our access to this early form of Syriac asceticism was really made possible only in the late 18th and 19th centuries by the Syriac manuscripts brought to Europe during that period from the famous monastery of the Syrians in Wadi Natrun in Egypt. If you want to keep a manuscript in great condition for centuries, take it to Egypt because the climate is perfect for preserving manuscripts. And by this sort of extraordinary stroke of luck, there was a Syriac language community living in that monastery for many centuries, and they had abbots who were bibliophiles and shoppers who would go back to the homeland in Mesopotamia, places like Edessa and so on, and they'd come home with manuscripts, much like the abbots of my community in the early 19th and 20th, or the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when they went off to Rome for abbots' meetings, would come back with uh, crates full of manuscripts. And this becomes the basis of what today is our very interesting rare book collection. Now the origins of this tradition are lost to us. In the writings of Afrahat, a very well-known and very interesting early Syriac author, who wrote in the 330s and 340s, we see the Kayama, the covenant, fully formed, and there is no backstory for it. This is not unusual in early Syriac literature because so much of it has been lost. We have no surviving texts from the crucial century celebrating the first well-known Syriac author, Bardaisan, who died in 222, and then Afrahat more than a century later. Seeing the covenant in its prime depends almost entirely on Afrahat, and then a century later on those descriptions of the covenant coexisting with a new form of asceticism in Edessa described by Rebula. The chronological gap between those two authors, itself about a century, shows the persistence of this model and the fact that Afrahad and Rabula lived on opposite sides of the Roman-Persian frontier, Afrahad on the Persian side, Rabula on the uh, Byzantine side, shows its geographical scope. So with that, we can begin to make the turn toward what I really want to talk about today, which is the Manichaeans. But before we go, Here's a nod to Afrahat, one of those great manuscripts in the British Library. And the other thing to realize about this particular text, upon which mountains of modern scholarly literature have been piled, is that the complete text has to be reconstructed from the only three surviving manuscripts. So we came this close to not even knowing about this. And then similarly, I mentioned the Book of Steps with the perfect and the just. This is the oldest manuscript from the 6th or 7th century. Uh, and this, is, this text featured in my doctoral work, so I'm very fond of it. And I was very pleased that we could digitize it in Jerusalem as part of the work of our manuscript project. So now, the ascetics praised by Ephraim, Afrahat, and the Book of Steps had their counterparts among the Martianites and Manichaeans, as I suggested. The Martianites were explicitly Christian, the Manichaeans permeated by Christian themes and language. And any direct view of them from now, from the 21st century, particularly of the Martianites, but also true of the Manichaeans, though less so, fortunately, because of recent discoveries, was eclipsed by the thorough efforts of the imperial church to completely eradicate them and destroy their literature. This was extremely successful. And so until recently, for example, Evidence for the Manichaean presence in Africa, Asia Minor, and large portion of the Middle East under Byzantine control was limited to gleaning material from their opponents. And that's not always the best way to get a, a well-rounded picture of a particular movement or tradition. The greatest challenge, I would argue, to the Catholic tradition and I think it becomes meaningful to use that term as we go into the fourth century and can identify Catholic as the party of Nicaea, 
you actually have a, a theological and doctrinal um, hook you can hang it on. The greatest challenge to the tradition identified with Syriac authors like Ephraim and Afrahat and others arguably came not so much from the Martianites as from the Manichaeans. Mani created a synthesis of Christian, Gnostic, and Zoroastrian thought and devised an institutional framework for its propagation. The missionary zeal of the Manichaeans reached across Central Asia into Western China, where they survived for centuries beyond the time of their suppression in the Byzantine and Persian empires. The Manichaeans are most familiar probably to you uh, from the young Augustine's fascination with their teaching part of his lifelong struggle with dualism. The industry with which he later fought them cannot be explained simply by his personal chagrin or embarrassment, but rather the Manichaean solution to the problem of the existence of good and evil, and therefore of life and death, evidently had great appeal. Because of their dualistic beliefs, both Martianites and certainly Manichaeans, as we can tell from the literature, placed asceticism, and particularly celibacy and dietary regulation, at the very heart of their religious practice. And they also managed to create confusion among the faithful of other Christian groups, who did not always follow the theological side of the equation, and could so easily be impressed by the ascetic accomplishments of these movements. So for example, around 350, we find Cyril of Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, warning the um, traveling catechumens that when they go to a town or village and it comes up to be Sunday and they inquire for the house of the Lord to know where to go, they might easily be directed to a Marcionite or Manichaean church. So this is how it, it read on the level of uh, you know, many of the faithful at the time. And I'll say more about that in just a moment. So, the Manichaeans. Until recently, Manichaeanism seemed like the dark matter of the third and fourth century. It was everywhere, we can tell from the impact it made on theologians and uh, church authorities, but it was impossible to observe directly, despite the abundant evidence of its indirect presence. Apart from scraps containing a few words, none of the original writings of Mani survived the extinction of the movement uh, in its Mesopotamian homeland. The so-called Manichaean version of the Syriac script that Mani used, perhaps invented, though almost entirely lost in his original writings because they were in the area where Manichaeism was so effectively effaced, lived on for its use in a variety of languages in Central Asia. So, so here's the man himself. Um, evidence suggests that he was very handsome and aware of that, and this was part of his charisma. And you can see him depicted in a very Persian representation with a kind of Persian hairstyle and beard. Um, it's been argued by Susanna Galashi, who's an art historian, that this crystal seal now in Paris is Mani's own seal that he would have worn and then used to seal documents. And the inscription around the edge and a slightly eccentric Syriac spelling of the name of Jesus has Mani's common identifier, Mani, apostle of Jesus Christ. In the early 20th century, troves of Manichaean literature were unearthed in Egypt and along the Silk Road into Central Asia and Western China. And in the 1960s, a tiny, and by tiny I mean tiny, 4.5 by 3.8 centimeters, uh, it's been described as the oldest, no, the smallest known Greek codex. I mean, this is smaller than pocket size, right? Smaller than your phone. This, was, uh, this manuscript surfaced in the Egyptian antiquities market, which is the notorious source for many of our early Christian texts from that region. And this manuscript contains a life of Mani in Greek, and it's particularly interesting because it has extensive quotations from his otherwise lost writings. So thanks to the Mani Codex, which as you can see had to be extensively restored, and then it was photographed, and then it was published, um, and that sort of, actually it was more rapidly published than is typical for Manichaean literature. Um, some of which didn't get published in time before it was destroyed or lost in World War II. 
But this has completely changed our understanding of Manichaeism because both the life of Mani in the Cologne Mani Codex and in other Manichaean literature, not by him directly, but by successive generations of his followers, found in various parts of Egypt, clearly anchor him in a broadly Christian framework, heavily influenced by the apocalyptic tradition of the Enoch literature of intertestamental Judaism and other uh, Christian movements like Valentinian Gnosticism. Scholars have identified influences from Iranian religion and possibly from Buddhism, an actual case of Buddhist contact with someone who could be understood in the broader uh, Christian ambit. And indeed, many scholars today describe Manichaeism as a form of Christianity, or at least a derived form. Now, Mani justified his movement on the basis that while he venerated Jesus and was happy to call himself the apostle of Jesus Christ and revered the Buddha and revered Zarathustra, he had to bring his complete and true revelation because they screwed up. Because what they did when they came is they proclaimed their message, but they relied on their followers to write it down. And in the process of that writing down, the message was corrupted. And so Mani said, I'm going to write my own stuff. And so this is the gospel by my own hand. And he accompanied it with a book of paintings. He apparently was an accomplished artist to depict it in picture form, so like flip charts that you could use in catechesis. And then he added to that his creation of a complete institutional structure for his movement. Now, the life of Mani and the teaching of Mani is, is really interesting, but in the, in the interest of time, I'm going to do that very briefly. The life of Mani, which is actually in, in a great uh, sort of Manichaean turn, described as the origins of his body. So you see the emphasis on the body as opposed to the kind of eternal spirit of Mani. Describes his upbringing in a male Jewish Christian ascetic group in southern Mesopotamia known as the Elkasites after their founder. They spoke Aramaic, they were celibate. Uh, many of them, like Mani's own father, uh, had been married men who then decamped to this ascetic group. And they had dietary prohibition, prohibitions related to meat, to wheat bread, which they called Greek bread, and despised because they associated it with the Gentiles, and also prohibitions on certain fruits and vegetables. And like the sectarian communities of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they practiced frequent ritual washings of body and food. So Mani called them the Baptists. And they hated the Gentile Christians and other Greek-speaking Christians, even Hellenized Jewish Christians, uh, because they followed the line of Paul. So we think of Paul as being totally mainstream in early Christianity. It was one branch, and it was the one that would uh, ultimately prove to be successful. Now, Mani's relationship with the Baptists began to grow tense because he started to receive intimations from palm trees and other plants that they didn't like being pruned and harvested by the Baptists, that they felt pain. And this acute sensitivity of Mani to other living things was reinforced when at the age of 24, he met a divine twin, sometimes called the divine double, who was sent from the father of greatness to reveal the message he was to reveal to the world. And in the Codex, the Cologne Mani Codex, the life of Mani, his eventual departure from the Baptist is justified by his conclusion that their ritual ablutions were pointless and their attitude toward creation was cruel. His argument against the ablutions was a Gnostic one. Only knowledge, the separation of truth from darkness, light from darkness, can truly purify the soul. Now, the, the life says he met the divine twin, and the divine twin filled him in. The process surely took longer, and it required exposure to literature and ideas that would not have been found in the library of that Jewish Christian Baptist sect. So philosophical writings, the writings of people like Bardison, apoc apocalyptic literature like the Book of Enoch, these are all texts that Mani would have read in Syriac. Aramaic speaker, Syriac, uh, an Aramaic dialect used for Christian writing. Uh, 
And gradually, we see a shift in his focus toward the north to places like Edessa. Now, his teaching was simple in principle and application, but it was very complex in its fullest form. So I'm going to give you the real simple form and not give you the stupefying account of the full Manichaean cosmology, uh, because you understand why Mani used pictures, because it's a highly visual, uh, interesting, if a little out there, understanding of things. So here's the short form. Mani's cosmos was torn by the conflict between light and darkness, two realms that originally existed separately, but were intermingled through the envy of darkness for light. The present situation of material creation is thus this state of mixture, manifest in human lust and the misuse of creation. But living things could be delivered from the admixture of darkness in them by liberating their particles of light, because there's light in all living things. Now, as I say, the complete system is almost impossible to describe in words, but the point of it all is life is all about maximizing your access to the particles of light in yourself and particles of light in other living things so that the balance of light and darkness in the universe can be tipped in favor of the light. And the, the actual way he describes this process is, is quite poetic. But the way it, it cashes out in practice is through the transactional relationship of the Manichaean elect and the catechumens. I should note here that one of the ways that Mani was so successful with uh, recruiting people from other Christian groups, in addition to what I'll describe in just a moment with the Manichaean sacred meal, is that his own literary style echoed that of Paul and other Christian writers. So let me just read you a couple sentences from uh, Mani's Gospel of Truth. I, Mani Kaios, apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, the Father of Truth, from whom I also came into being. He lives and abides for all eternity, before everything he is, and he remains after everything. Everything which has happened and will happen is established through his power, and from him I have my being, and I exist also according to his will. And from him all that is true was revealed to me, and from his truth I exist. Now, it seems that over time, this originally strongly Christian packaging of Mani's teaching was lessened, and Mani himself became more central to the story, so less Mani, Apostle of Jesus Christ, and more Mani, the Apostle. But nonetheless, the Christian flavor remained sufficient to entice and assuage those drawn to the movement from more traditional Christianity. As Ian Gardner has noted, such converts would not have been overly focused on points of doctrine. He writes, the concerns of the mass of believers were necessarily more matter of fact, for whom Manichaeism would have been a kind of higher and more effective Christianity. So as we've seen, Mani taught that all living things, including plants, animals, and the earth itself, experience the pain of material existence. And therefore, acts of violence against them tip the scales toward darkness, and then forms of practice to recover the particles of light tips it the other way. And so for Manichaeans, the struggle between light and darkness played out particularly in sexuality and diet, which in their view were the cause of suffering by humans and other living beings. Therefore, there were the three seals of the mouth, hands and breast, which governed what was eaten, how one interacted with other living things, and the management of sexual desire. And the three seals were complemented by five commandments, not to lie, not to kill any living thing, even plants, not to eat flesh, to remain pure, and to practice blessed poverty. Mani entrusted the whole system and that complete array of ascetic practice to the core adepts, the elect. Only they, after all, could perfectly perform the seals and commandments. Support for them, for the elect, and indeed the practical economy of the movement depended upon the householders, the catechumens. They, in turn, depended on the elect for instruction and for access to the particles of light released by the elect through their fasting and celibacy. This transaction occurred in the central Manichaean ritual of a sacred meal, 
in which the elect consumed bread offered by the catechumens. Now, obviously, the analogy with the Christian Eucharist is quite imperfect, but for many converts drawn to the message, the echo of a familiar rite was sufficient. So, too, the conclusion of Manichaean Psalms for their echo of a Trinitarian doxology. Glory to our Father, our Master and Paraclete, Mani the Living, the Spirit of Truth, and all his holy elect and his catechumens of the faith. Now, because the catechumens had no hope of salvation without the prayers of the elect, asceticism was not simply an exemplary and prized element of the Manichaean community, but an essential component of it. This is where the ascetic constructs of the perfect and the just in the Book of Steps, the sons and daughters of the covenant, or later Christian monasticism differed from Marcionite and Manichaean asceticism. It was possible for Christianity to exist without celibate, fasting, dispossessed ascetics, even if in practice it rarely did. But this was impossible for Marcionites and Manichaeans for whom it was baked in to the very essence of their churches. Another difference is in what we might call spirituality. Mani did not theorize about the elect. He praised them, but he did not theorize about them in the way that later Christian monastic authors or authors of treatises on virginity and so on would do. Uh, instead, it was very practical and even utilitarian and transactional. The elect ate the bread, offered by the catechumens, and therefore the catechumens gained access to a greater share of light. All right, so the impact of all of this on Syriac asceticism, and this is my, my last round here. The Syriac poet Ephraim wrote extensively on the threat of these groups in Mesopotamia. Ephraim was a prolific author and vigorous advocate of Nicene Christianity in his hometown of Nisibis, now uh, New Sibene on the Turkish-Syrian border, and then after a treaty ceding Nisibis to the Persians in 363 in Edessa, that famous historic cradle of Syriac Christianity. Ephraim, in his 56 Hymns Against Heresies and his substantial prose refutations, targets the Martianites, the Bardaisanites, the native Edessene movement, which had Christian elements, astrological elements, philosophical elements, and so on, um, particularly in these writings. And in the last of his 56 hymns, he offers thanks for being in a church free of the book of the raving Marcion, the writing of the insane Mani, or the book of mysteries, the hateful things of Bardaisan. Instead, the church, for Ephraim, the Nicene church, possessed the true scriptures, the two testaments of the king and of the king's son. Now, Afrahat and uh, Ephraim particularly, and then Afrahat to some extent, critique the Manichaeans and the Martianites extensively for their dualism and theology, but they have little to say about their asceticism, apart from a kind of grudging admittance that they were really good at it. He writes, Marcion girds himself with sackcloth to darken the sons of light. Mani seduces with his pallor, the sort of you know, beautiful pallor of, of Mani, which apparently was part of his marketing. Similarly, describing Satan's wiles toward women, Ephraim writes, today in various ways he has seduced the simple women. One he captures with fasting, so that would be the Manichaeans working on behalf of Satan. Another by sackcloth and vegetables, the Marcionites. Another by eloquence, those philosophical bardai sanites. Now, I could go on with examples of the polemic and the intensity of the polemic, but it is very clear that the Manichaeans and the Martianites, but I would argue especially the Manichaeans, loomed large in uh, not only the imaginarium or the, the nighttime fears and fantasies of people like Ephraim, but in their daily existence, particularly given the fact that Ephraim represented a community in Edessa which seemed to have been a minority Christian group because they followed Nicaea and were not even honored with the term Christian, but were called Paulutians after the name of their leader. At this point in this presentation, you might expect me 
finally to pull out the crucial piece of evidence, the smoking gun, that confirms the trajectory I have outlined to show that it was Manichaean asceticism that shaped the creation of the sons and daughters of the covenant as that ascetic elite fully and formally integrated into the life of the church, and similarly, the ascetics of the Book of Steps. Sadly, such a clear link in Smoking Gun does not exist, and we can blame it on the lack of literature that I mentioned earlier. But is it unreasonable to suggest that in that blank century of Syriac Christianity, from which we have no surviving literature, between the time of Bardisan, 222, and Afrahat, active in the 330s and 340s, the time also of Ephraim in the Book of Steps, is it unreasonable to suggest that the phenomenal success of Mani's church and the ascetic heart of it had an influence on the shape of Syriac asceticism, and then on Eustathian asceticism, and then on the asceticism of Basil the Great? Ephraim's sense of panic was surely based on more than ideas. The Martianites and Manichaeans were truly an existential threat. For at least six decades before Afrahat wrote, and almost a century before Ephraim, Mani's followers were spreading across Mesopotamia, joining the more established Martianites as ascetic forms of what they themselves would have claimed was Christianity. It may be that this is not a detective story with the kind of evidence that can produce a, a final conclusion or a conviction in a court of law, but something more like a spy novel. And so I'm going to conclude by, by channeling the spirit of the late, great John Lacari, who, if he were asked to describe the situation and the stalemate even between the Manichaeans and the Syriac Christians before imperial power was brought fully to bear on the Manichaeans, might have written something like this. When they met, as they often must have, they eyed one another like spies on a bridge who could regard the other with perfect understanding across utterly irreconcilable differences. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I think we're going to do questions. You're going to say a few words, all right. So, thank you so much. So we're going to take questions. We have, because of COVID um, protocols, it's safer rather than pass the microphones if you could go to one of the two stationary uh, microphones. If if you're not mobile enough to do that, raise your hand and we will have someone bring um, you a microphone. And if you could please tell us who you are um, and as much as possible keep your questions crisply put, uh, that would be uh, very welcome. And also afterwards, because I'm going to forget it <laughs> um, after the Q&A, please join us for the reception. If you go out the main door and you walk past the first white tent, you will see a lovely esplanade in front of White Gravener with another white tent, and uh, we will have drinks and food there to continue the conversation. So uh, questions, please, at the microphones. Thank you. Um, I admire your fortitude in staying awake in a warm room at 5 in the afternoon. Uh, I have the advantage of standing. Uh, so I'm going to fan myself slightly and allow you to enjoy a surviving fragment of a Manichaean text in the original Syriac. Honestly, people, this is like all there's left. This left is a, a little fragment or two like this, but it's, it's a beautiful hand. So you can look at that while we converse. Uh, my name is Fred Kellogg. I'm associated with the other university named after our first president. Um, I, my question is when Basil the Great's sister said, um, let's go to the ranch and become ascetics. What was the word that she used, and what is the origin, what is the first word that was used to describe um, among ascetics themselves and their practice, and was that word the same um, across 
the, the lands of the fourth century, for, perhaps, or the third or the second? Uh, that's a very good question. So there was an existing vocabulary to describe asceticism, a vocabulary which had been basically derived from Greek philosophy. And it occurs very often in these Greek ascetic texts. So the, you know, words that are the basis of our terms ascetic or, uh, or of the, uh, the term enkratia, which you sometimes see, uh, and a verbal form of that, which is describing a form of discipline, particularly related in Christian terms to elementary and sexual discipline. So there's, there is that kind of thing. But uh, you know, Macrina and Basil's family, and indeed Basil himself, never described themselves as monks or female equivalent of the term monk, which of course in Greek can also be feminine with a different ending. Instead, they described themselves as uh, devoted ones, pious ones. They spoke of their brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, there are occasional references to the dwelling as uh, a monet, which is you know, the same word that ultimately gives us eventually our word monastery. But Basil really takes pains in his own writings to avoid any term that technically distinguishes an ascetic from other Christians. And this is reflecting that whole tension around Eusebius um, and other earlier Christian controversies like the Encratites and so on, where the issue was precisely sectarian tendencies of ascetics and the effort to rein them in and bring them back and to have them live in the church in a way that did not provide an explicit or implicit judgment on the life of householders, married householders. Thank you. Thank you for a splendid, splendid lecture. I'm Jane McAuliffe, uh, currently with the Berkeley Center here at Georgetown. You mentioned um, in talking about the Eustachian form of, of asceticism um, that in one of the manuscripts that you showed us that there were, uh, I don't think you called them ranks, but they were kind of analogous to the bishop priest, deacon, and subdeacon. Um, what were those categories, and did one move from one to another? Uh, was it a graduated series of ascetical ranking? So this was in the, the Syriac text. Yeah. So you know, maybe that influenced the Eustathian. But the, the Syriac models were that the ascetic group consisted basically of two wings. So there were the um, never married ascetics, sons and daughters of the covenant. And they were like, you know, slightly higher ranking. And then there were the previously married ascetics, the holy ones or consecrated ones. And so those are the terms that you find in these lists and these martyr accounts. And what's so striking about it is there's nothing like that on the kind of Byzantine or Western side, um, where ascetics have that formally recognized place in the church. It would be like later texts, which would frequently identify somebody as you know, monk or nun um, or something. But in this early period, this is very unusual. And it, it shows how clearly, how well established and clearly recognized and delineated this ascetic element of the church was at the time. Thanks for that clarification. My name is Tim Green, and I have absolutely no credentials at all. I'm just interested in this kind of stuff. Um, stuff, sorry. Uh, I, I have a language question, a, a, a history of, of language question. Mm -hmm. uh, did, did virtually everybody uh, about whom we've talked tonight understand Greek, read, read Greek and understand Greek, or no? Was, were there other options? And the, the second half, half of the question is, um, um, about Syriac and Aramaic. Um, when, when or why did people write in Aramaic and when did they write in Syriac? And what relation to that is, is that to the Pesh, is it the Peshta? Mm -hmm. the, yes, okay, okay th that's my question. Okay, so the, that's a good question. The issue of whether certain Syriac authors had a good command of the Greek language or literature is a controversial one. And there was an earlier tendency in kind of 19th century romanticized scholarship of Syriac Christianity to argue that it was a purely Semitic and biblical Christianity. 
untainted by the influence of Greek philosophy and Hellenism. Now this is a little dicey given the fact that the New Testament's written in Greek. So that is a kind of irreducible problem if you're going to observe such a distinction. And there's been a lot of work done on, uh, for example, obvious influence of Greek philosophy on Ephraim, who was always held up as a great example of the pure uh, Syriac poet. Now, whether Ephraim himself could have access to some Greek, entirely possible. I don't know that it's been proven. I'm going to look at my colleagues here. I don't know that we have particular proof of it. But uh, to give you an example, in Nisibus, where Ephraim uh, was until he had to move to Edessa, in the church there, the Church of St. Jacob of Nisibus, there's a Greek inscription over the baptistry. And the date of it is 350s, 60s? I don't know. I'm looking at Robin, but maybe she doesn't remember. It's somewhere, it is still there. I've seen it myself. I've touched it and photographed it. And so there's an inscription in Greek on a church there. So there was a certain kind of uh, coexistence, even if Greek may have been used on certain occasions by certain people, like the way our great civic monuments in Washington have Latin inscriptions. So it's a way of kind of signaling class and lineage, even if it wasn't the common language. So I'm, I'm not answering your question directly because it's a difficult one to answer. There's no doubt, however, that a generation later, um, people writing in Syriac were fully able to read Greek, translate a Greek text. There's this huge wave of translations of philosophy and theology and monastic writings. And so by that point, it's, it's everywhere. So Aramaic and Syriac. Syriac is really just a dialect of Aramaic. Aramaic understood as the lingua franca of the entire ancient Near East. So you know, Palestinian form of Aramaic, uh, which was written and used by Christians there. And then Syriac is the, the term used for the particular dialect of Edessa, which was written down using a new script. Uh, and so that was used to write this Edessene dialect, which was not originally uh, a Christian invention, but rapidly became a Christian language as Christianity spread in the region. But if you know uh, Syriac, you can read a lot of Aramaic texts fairly easily, even though they're often in Hebrew script, and vice versa, once you just get over the letter form. I'm Margaret Coaston, and this follows to some extent on the last question. I um, had been trying to remember from 50 years ago when I studied Manichaeism, and I was thinking that the dualism had something to do with Gnosticism or Neoplatonism, that it was spirit and physical body. But it sounded, when you were talking, as though it really isn't that. It's light and dark. And when you talked about creation and the respect for creation, it sounded quite different from what I remember Neoplatonism to be. So I just wondered if you could sort of talk about that. Again, I think it comes back to what you're talking about, the Greek influence, but they're, they seem to be two separate models, and I was thinking that they overlapped a little more than they seem to. I think they really are more or less the same, but there's no doubt that Mani preferred light and darkness. And it is a, a nicer way of talking about it. But the reality is that bodies, um, as material things, are heavy and dark. And though living things, because of the spirit in them, a spirit which can be also in uh, plants and other living things, there is light in them by virtue of that. And then there's a whole, I spared you the full description of the Manichaean cosmology. But basically, what it comes down to is that, let's just stick with humans and not get into plants. Um, Mani says that the reason that humans have bits of light in them is that the envious powers of darkness created a new creature, which is humans. And they patterned it after this kind of divine archetype. So it's not the image and likeness of God, but it's more or less that. And this was all part of their effort themselves to control light and therefore maximize their own advantage. And by virtue of that um, either strategic decision or strategic mistake, of the forces of darkness, we do have in us, by virtue of that archetype, this living spirit which has light. 
but the body itself is a problem. And sexuality is a problem because it perpetuates uh, the corporality and the materiality of human beings. Now the plant thing is complicated. So it seems that you can um, you know, gently remove the fruit for the sake of liberating its own particles, but you know, cutting things and uprooting things are what he found problematic. Now, this is another example of a, a sort of Manichae, Manichaean uh, you know, purism or view, or purist view, which could only really be done by people who got all their stuff from somebody else. So, you know, the hands of the elect were not soiled by uh, pulling up a radish or harvesting the cucumber or, uh, you know, cutting the dates, a bunch of dates off the tree. Uh, that was done by the catechumens. And then having done that thing as an act of reparation for what, they're, what they had done necessarily for the sake of survival, um, then the elect would on their behalf liberate the particles. Now Augustine mocked this because you know, he makes fun of the Manichaeans for saying you should eat cucumbers and cantaloupes because they have more light particles. But actually I think we kind of say the same, don't we? So, um, maybe not for the same reason. But he, it's, he's inspired by Marcion and that creator-creation problem. So there's no doubt that there are strong affinities with that other dualistic model. One more? I, I'm sorry, can we continue the conversation at the reception? I'm so sorry. Um, so thank you, Columbus Stewart, for a, a marvelous... Thank you, Julia Lamb. <laughs> And please join us out in front of White Gravener for a reception and continuation of the conversation. Thank you so much.